Meepu, let me ask you something. You have said that in order to solve the energy problem, the first thing you have to do is frame the problem correctly. How would you frame the energy problem that we're trying to solve here? So what I've been trying to tell people, and I have this discussion, is that we need to uh, look at the benefits and costs of the energy from all sides and that there are uh, challenges that we all know. We all know that it's a very big problem, arguably the largest problem that we are facing. And supplying energy so that people can live healthy, productive lives is a big challenge. It's going to take a lot of energy. And we have to begin by appreciating how much of it that we are using. Too often the debate has been, oh, you have to balance the needs of people or the or of the environment, you have to protect the environment by cutting down the CO2, that's, that's fine. That is one important, very compelling need. But if it is not balanced by the other moral imperative, which is to allow people to live healthy, productive lives, then I think we are missing the tougher challenge. So it's That is really it's the tension that is there, is the tension between the uh, need to provide adequate energy for people to develop. Now you were the co-author of a book called A Cubic Mile of Oil. In fact, you have a copy of the book right there. Yeah. Maybe you can hold it up to that camera over there so we can take okay. a look at it. Sure. Okay, there it is. Yes. So what is that concept about? What does that mean, a cubic mile of oil? So we have all heard that the world uses somewhere about 80 million barrels of oil a day. I'm not sure many of us appreciate what the, how much that amount is, but 80 million barrels over one year is equal to a, uh, one cubic mile. That much of energy is what we use in oil itself. When we talk about you know, energy it, we get from oil, we get from coal, we get from wind, we get from photovoltaics, we get from hydro, we get from nuclear power, gas, all these different sources. And for each source, it's typically described in uh, a different unit. Oil is always described in gallons, barrels, or something like that. Coal in tons. Natural gas in trillions cubic feet, and uh, so on and so forth. Electricity is always in kilowatt hours or multiples thereof. So you're trying to have a common unit a of common measure unit. so you can compare how much oil yeah. you use to how much coal you use? Right. That, and also a number that, a unit that is, uh, that scales to the global use. Because you could use you know, joules, that's a perfectly good unit, scientific. I was, uh, it and joules are not those things you wear around your neck, those, those energy talking. units that energy you learn about in right, physics. Right, right, right. So, you know, the world uses in a year about uh, 570 exajoules of energy, you know, something like that, or a number like that, but it's, it doesn't resonate with, any, with people. It doesn't. But if I tell you that we get one cubic mile of oil, uh, from oil, and on top of that, the billions of tons of coal that we burn give us eight-tenths of a cubic mile oil of energy and six-tenths of cubic mile of energy from natural gas, two-tenths each from hydro, nuclear, and wind. It gives a more and clear picture. And, and, and uh, wood burning, sorry, not wind, wood burning for a total of three cubic miles of oil. It gives us a picture. We actually have some slides which are going to illustrate what you're talking about. Can we see that first slide, please? Okay, so that is a picture of a cubic mile of oil. Yeah, and I tried to use a monument uh, nearby that may be recognizable. And it's the Statue of Liberty, Liberty in the corner but, to show the size. But it was very difficult. No, it's the red circle that you see around it is to remind me to tell you, you're looking at the Statue of Liberty through a big magnifying glass. It's about blown up ten times to put it on scale on so, this picture. So at this scale with the Statue of Liberty, the cubic mile is too small. Uh, the Statue of Liberty is too small, so too I have small. yeah, that's right. Okay, okay, let's take a look at the next slide. I have to blow up the okay. Statue of Liberty. <laughs> okay, now this this is a little far away to Wait. read it, but so this tells what we're using energy for. Right. Okay. So, I, I told you already that we are using about three cubic miles of energy. Most of that, about thirty six, thirty seven percent of that, goes immediately into producing electricity. That's a very useful form, you know because it's a very useful form of energy, it's a good carrier. It's not a primary source of energy. Primary energy is what I gave you earlier. And 
then it is the remaining sources, the remaining sectors that we use are like for transportation about 29 percent, residential commercials which is the built environment if you will, and uh, industrial, those are the other. So the chart on the left shows different uses of energy yeah. including electricity as a separate category right. and then the chart on the right the electricity is merged into the other categories. To the extent they are used in the others. But right. transportation hardly increased at all. That's right. We don't use electricity for transportation at the moment. We have very little amount of that. Some railway, electric rails are there, but it's minuscule. A few electric cars, but very few. They, they won't register on this scale. We have one more slide. Let's go ahead and look at the third slide. Okay, so this is where we get energy from. Yeah, this is what's showing all the different primary sources of energy. So oil giving us one, coal giving us eight tenths of a, a CMO or cubic mile of oil, six tenths from natural gas, and two tenths each of nuclear, hydro, and wood burning. And then those thin slivers that you see are the geothermal, the wind, the photovoltaics, the biofuels, and all that. Right. So some of these alternate fuels that we're always reading about in the newspapers yeah. that are always being touted as the next big wave like solar and... Uh, yeah. Wind and wave power, that's really minuscule use right now. At the moment, yes. Is and that's any? the one we need to grow to that big. And what, what has to have, what would it take what? to make those? Because those are desirable because you don't have to mine wind currents. Right. They're already there. Right, yeah. These are what we call our income sources. The coal, oil, and nuclear, and gas, these are our inheritance. So, so far we have been living off our inheritance and transitioning to income, which is being given by the sun each year, a lot of it is something to get there. But it's a long way and it takes a long time. Uh, the sun, by the way, on the CMO scale, endows us with 23,000 CMO every year. That's cubic miles of oil. Yes, we are looking for three, four, five, something like that. That's what we are using now. Three is what we are using and we are probably grow to six or nine by the middle of the century. So the amount of solar power that falls on the earth every year is far in excess. Far, if, far if in excess. If we could just capture it. If we could capture it. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of land. No, we don't. Uh, you know, 10,000 square mile or 50,000 square miles would be the kind of things that you would need to dedicate for that. Plus, how, do, how are you going to, where are you going to do with, where are you going to find that? There are places, but if they are too far from the people that need it, uh, you need some other infrastructure to build. Sun is, doesn't shine all the time, wind doesn't blow all the time, so we need other uh, things like storage that need to be developed at scale. We can, we can s store electricity in little batteries, but the cost is very high, you know, compared well, that, to... Well, that's one of the limiting factors the cost. of electricity, isn't it? The fact that electricity is hard to store. Yeah. You kind of have to use it as soon as it's created. You can store it in batteries, but it's very inefficient. Like, the battery used in an all-electric car weighs about 900 pounds. I it's guess they are improving. They could be a, a little less now, but still, it's a, it's a fair... You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And, and they don't last forever. <laughs> now, now, with solar power, is there a measure of efficiency of solar panels so that at least you're making full use of the solar power that's landing on that panel. You're not wasting anything uh -huh. that, that's hitting you. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question and uh, it, it is an important aspect of it. Typical photovoltaics uh, materials, you know, right now that we get a 15 to 20 percent efficient. Uh, that means 15 to 20 percent of the sunlight that was incident on that is converted into usable electrical energy. Uh, what that translates into, and something important to appreciate, is uh, the more efficient it is, the less area you would need. Right now in the way the structure, it's not that the photovoltaic material itself is the most expensive part. The most expensive part is the balance of system. You have all the support structures and all that really add to the cost in installing it. If you can make it smaller, your installation costs go down. And that's what's where the bigger inefficiencies are at the moment. So improving the efficiency of the photovoltaic material, the photoactive material, has a big impact on the total cost in that reason. So research that's being done to improve that from 20 to 40 percent or 